Welcome to this month's Insights interview from the Payments Association. I'm Tony Craddock. I'm the Director General here. And our VIP guest this month is a legal powerhouse. And he brings a, an entrepreneurial fintech mindset and a deep knowledge of the law to, to, the, world of, to the world of payments. Um, he's a partner in the London office of a global firm with a wide range of experience advising on cutting edge fintech initiatives. He's been described as one of the most daring, innovative, and creative lawyers, my word, in 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 uh, in, in payments. Uh, so to find out a bit about a, a bit about him and his background, uh, and what we can expect from a legal perspective in future, uh, please welcome Stuart Davis. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Tony. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Really great to have you here. So, Stuart, at the start of every single Insights interview that I've I've run, um, I ask my VIP guest um, how he stays motivated. Uh, when facing the balancing of uh, facing face with balancing the challenges of of work and home lives and blimey you have three kids under six so um you have a certainly challenges of background as well i have to stay motivated put it that way um yeah. it's, it's a great question and i said that, you know lots of ways to stay motivated in this space firstly the space is incredibly innovative um so constantly faced with new products services technology, um, which really means that no day is ever the same when advising clients and giving legal advice. So we're constantly at the cutting edge of, of, of what we do. That motivates me uh, immensely. But also seeing my team develop over the years um, and, and going from some junior lawyers to really industry leaders in their own right, that is a fantastic motivation and it's something that will keep me going hopefully for the rest of my career, um, helping clients through, you know, sometimes challenging circumstances and also launching products that when you start the process with the client, it's not entirely clear that, you know, the product can be launched or launched in that way and helping them through difficult solutions and, and getting there in the end. That, you know, motivates me immensely. Um, seeing the change in this industry, I think it's gone from, you know, an industry where regulation and law, um, you know, is perhaps less sophisticated 10, 15 years ago. And we're now really at the, the cutting edge, um, I would say, of, of legal practice in the payments industry. And it's, it's just great to see. You know, it's an extraordinary space, isn't it? I, I keep on having to pinch myself to say, how on earth did we end up here? I mean, because nobody would have kind of chosen to be in payments a few years ago, but now this is a place to be. But so, you, but but things are changing fast. Law, as you say, is is leading the way. Um, I, I think internationally. Tell me, um, when when you're faced with some of the sort of complexities of our industry, how do you? What what is if you like your your northern star? And I use that, that phrase it because it is something that a number of when you when you when the world the world is so complicated, um, you have to have a few guiding principles. What are the guiding principles that kind of helped you on your way? Sure, um, there are a few. I mean, the first and in, in a space where you're you're pushing at the at the boundaries of what's possible is you need to maintain integrity at all times. Um, do do the right thing, both you know for you know, personally for the team, the firm, for clients, importantly, and and for the industry. So that's really the key guiding star. Um, I think ensuring that you're looking towards the future, that you're helping people in the industry come through, um, is an incredibly important thing to to, to always be mindful of. Um, I think remembering that we're incredibly lucky and being able to do yes. what we do. Yes. So, you know, let's be nice to people and try and enjoy it. Um, because you know, you only get to do this once. And um I think it's, you know, while it's an incredibly serious and um, you know, challenging industry at times, particularly with the amount of change and um you know, new, new direction, um, I think it's really important to kind of keep feet on the ground and and just make sure you have a good time while while working. Yes, and have some fun with it. I, I I sort of look back at your career. You started by studying studying law at, at Cambridge, and then you know had a decade at Linklater's, and and moved to Latham and Watkins um, 
six years ago. And you know, you've also been recognized. You've got a few useful stickers. You've recognized as the, the legal 500 um, next generation partner for fintech. Uh, you were named as a 2019 rising star by Law 360, my word. You were also honored by the Lawyer magazine in, um, uh, in, in the disruptors section of its Hot 100 in 2018. I must say, I would love to have been a part of the Hot 100. I never was. Uh, but so, um, you know, what, what was it when you were young, when you were a kid, a nipper, that, that, that maybe would have helped you um, predict that you wouldn't just be a lawyer, but the one that was kind of seen as a mover and a shaker and a disruptor? Uh, difficult to say, really. I'm a um, you know, first generation professional from the northeast of England. Uh, so my parents left school at 16 and go to university. Um, I think I always enjoyed um, people. I, you know, working with people and meeting people and law is ultimately a people business. So yeah. um, maybe that was, was helpful. I think I was always curious. I had a real curiosity. Um, so at the start of my career, you know, is the 2008 financial crisis. Um, I developed a real deep interest in understanding what had gone wrong um, and how things worked. And that led me to spend a lot of time studying the plumbing of the financial markets mm -hmm. um, understanding how systems work uh, maybe that curiosity from when i was younger kind of fed through and into that and i think that was a really important and formative part of my career because once you start to understand how the different financial or parts of the financial system uh, interoperate and talk to each other um how uh how they don't and, and some of yes. the problems you can start to think about how you might be able to improve them and disrupt them um so it's probably about 2014 when i uh you know first heard the word blockchain <laughs> um, oh, wow. and 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 started to to really think well actually there's a technology there for example that could you know really help to innovate possibly cause some disruption and in yes. traditional financial market infrastructure. Yes. Um, putting those two together, so technology innovation with knowledge of what the current state of play is, I think was really important to me. And, you know, that's one part of my career and a lot of the work that I do is in sort of technology innovation, blockchain, digital assets, et cetera. But that curiosity in the payment space, um, I think was equally as important, you know, understanding how, you know the increasingly complicated payment market works um, and i love piecing that jigsaw together but, but, but what's fascinating is you're not talking you're not saying i'm fascinated by the law you're fascinated by the industry and the interplay of the different components yeah. and so when when you were a kid when you were a nipper i mean what do your mum and dad do what, what are they doing now my dad is now retired but was in construction uh, yeah. And you know, my mum looked after us as kids. So cool. So really, <laughs> yeah. from a from a completely no professional to background, right. you've so were you were you one of these kids who kind of used to do the Meccano and Lego and stuff? Or yeah, I was, you, yeah, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, anything to do with construction um, yeah. systems. So I think you know, I wanted to be an architect when I was younger. Um, yeah. But you know, for that exact reason. But I sort of fell into the law. Um, you know, I um, I started to get very interested um, in my teens in um, economics. I started to study that at school, and um, you know, again, how the how the economy works, how systems work, etc. And um, but I was, you know, uh, I've got a lawyer's uh, sense of mathematics, put it that way. Right. Right. <laughs> so I was right. never going to be an economist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I started to then get interested in, in law, you know, um, society, um, and, and, uh, and, and decided I'd go and study that at university. And to be honest, um, the law is a fascinating, um, fascinating field to study. You learn yeah. a lot about people, you learn a lot about business, um, you know, and, and you learn a lot about yourself as well in studying. I and do you know, I think, I think we, I hope potential lawyers, people who are at uh, sort of undergraduate level uh, are, are, are listening to this and remembering that law isn't about, being a lawyer isn't just about the law, it's mm -hmm. about much more than that. 
That's right. Um, that's right. When you study law at university, um, you know, it, it, it can be quite academic, um, obviously. Uh, I, was, I was put off it for that reason. I was put off it for the partly because I'm, I'm a bit scatterbrained and I just couldn't remember enough stuff. And but the, but when I look at what the, my, the respected lawyers that I, I know and admire like you, they they definitely don't take a legal first perspective. I'd like, I'd like to move on and talk a little bit about the law and the payments industry, actually, if I may, a sort of second part. By the way, I bet your mum and dad will be very proud of you. And I hope to goodness that they listen to this recording. I hope they do. I hope you send it up to them. Um, uh, and if they've got bored by now and switched off and gone and done something else, then you'd be really sad. Um, so there's some good stuff to come, mum and dad. Stick with it. Stick with it. So so let's talk about the payments industry now. Um, you know, I remember when I when I was starting out in payments, um, you know, that we've seen the three drivers behind the industry. One was um, one was uh, technology, one was consumer adoption, and of course the third was was regulation. And, and you know, the, that all plays a, a really special, almost a unique role in our industry. And it's even more important than ever, especially when you look at. I mean, we just highlighting the fact we've got eight or nine con industry consultations undergo at the moment, which sort of are about the law, but then about policy, which is kind of broader than law. You know, what, what I'd like is to hear is, as a, as a, as a as representative of Latham and Watkins, um, uh, what, are the, what are the three main trends in the law relating to payments? That might be almost impossible to say that, but if you had to pick three, what would the three be? Sure, it's a fascinating question, um, and it's one that I could, you know, probably pick ten, but I'll try and stick yeah. to three. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, the first is is the scope of the law and regulation and how it applies to payment services. Um, you know, the the first payment services directive um, set out what should fall within the scope of the regulation. Who should, who needs to have a license to conduct various activities. Um, you know, that typically, at least in the UK and our interpretation of that law, excluded e-commerce platforms, for example. And so there's an exemption for technical service providers. So big tech um, would be outside of scope. And PSD2 came along and um, it tweaked an exemption, which typically e-commerce providers would use to be able to um, you know, process payments on their platforms and more e-commerce platforms, if they, you know, if they control or possess funds that are coming in through the platform, they would fall within scope. Um, so there's been a whole swathe of, you know, payment solutions in the industry to help e-commerce platforms deal with that. Um, but I think going forward, that scoping question is going to be a very key question because, mm um regulators and legislators are certainly looking at um, platforms and they're looking at big tech providers and thinking actually you know should these exemptions even in the way in which they exist today should they continue to exist or mm. should we impose regulation on on those parts of the of the ecosystem and i think that will have a really significant change if, if they do I hadn't, I hadn't even, I haven't even thought about that. But that's that's a huge shift, because because that would in, that would enwrap a whole range of current, currently excluded organisations in within the regulatory perimeter. Correct gateways, um, you know, uh, API providers that aren't you know currently um, in scope necessarily because they're not you know PISPs or ASPs, um, you know, might might fall within scope, you know. Uh, or everything that you know potentially goes on inside your mobile phone when making a payment um, is 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 there and, and currently being discussed by by the regulators. Okay, good. So that's that's the first thing. Number yeah. one. Um, number two is safeguarding from a legal Ooh. perspective. Ooh, that, that's that's a, safeguarding is a dirty word in our industry. Or rather, <laughs> it's one of the hardest things to get right. It's extremely challenging, and we're lucky in the UK in that we have you know the FCA's approach document, which provides you know good guidance um, for what you need to comply with from a safeguarding perspective. Whereas in many EU jurisdictions, you know, same you know directive, same source of the law, but but many. Uh, regulators haven't published anything near the guidance that we have. Um, but the challenge with safeguarding is that that, that law was not clear enough um, when it was 
um, when it was published, brought in force, um, it wasn't clear that the safeguarded funds were legally held on trust for the underlying holders of, of electronic money or underlying payment customers. Um, and there's been a number of cases in the UK and more broadly on just how protected are your funds um, mm. and they're being safeguarded. Yeah. It's a real challenge for industry players because you know they're seeking just to comply with the rules, um, rightly so. Um, but if the rules themselves aren't quite sufficient, then um, you know what, what are they to do? So legislators and regulators are looking at this at the moment. Um, the Treasury is currently considering whether to look at the rules in an investment banking context, which are called CAS rules, client asset source yeah. book rules, and apply similar trust-like concepts um, to the safeguarding uh, mm. arena, which would, if they were to sort of read across directly, it would, it would be a statutory trust um, would be applied to safeguarded funds. So you'd have much more uh, protection. However, I would say that there is a great degree of literature around CAS since Lehman Brothers, um, where that regime was tested, that regime has now been updated. And I think it would significantly uh, increase the compliance burden on, um, on payment providers because and, of the and, detailed regime. And that's part of the problem, mm -hmm. is because for us to be as sufficiently compliant as perhaps the the ideal, if you like, total consumer protection would enable, the cost of that then mitigates against our industry being successful and making any money, which means saying all the stuff that's made it possible for us to do well, the investment funding, will be withdrawn because how do you make an ROI on an extremely cost-heavy uh, cost, cost heavy, um, industry? So I'm, I must say I'm, I'm worried about that. Yeah, I am. Um, I think on, on the other hand, I think one thing that tends to reduce costs in the industry is an aligned pathway and certainty. And I think that's what we don't have at the moment. I think safeguarding account providers struggle um, with taking on their own risk. Um, if you know a provider were to go insolvent, for example, how do they pay out the funds? Who do they pay them to? Um, so if if you could get this regime right and make you know certainty in, in the market paramount, then it could have the opposite effect that could reduce cost. Um, so that's the hope. And I think it's something which should be consulted on. I think the industry should be at the forefront in mm. helping to inform the rules. Um, but it's certainly something that I think payment providers, e-money issuers need to be uh, need to be looking at in, in 2023. Very good. Okay, so that's the second thing. What's the third thing? I have to say a new technology. I can't, <laughs> yes, yes. I can't have a have have a discussion like this and not not mention technology. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the obvious place to to start when you're thinking about new technology in, in this arena is obviously in stable coins, CBDCs, etc. Mm -hmm. Um that, that they get a lot of you know airwaves and, and media attention, but it's not just stable coins and CBDCs, it's you know, it's the consultation in open banking and where yes. do we go with open banking? How do we make that um, an even more kind of frictionless process? Um, it's authentication, new technology and authentication methods. You know, how yes. do people the confidence, providers the confidence to, to provide them and users the confidence to use them? Um, open finance is, you know, the next step in open banking. We've had yeah. a sort of uh sort of consultations on open finance and the smart data initiative kind of plows on but mm -hmm. but, but when is that going to happen what you know what are, what is the framework going to look like for open finance and how um do we ensure that the the gains and the technology build that the industry has gone through for open banking isn't wasted um, and 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 is interoperable with whatever we bring in for open finance. I think that's really crucial. We all believe that the, the next phase is going to be crucial. Yeah. The output from the Joint Regulatory Oversight Committee mm. um, and with Marion King's arrival as the trustee and chair of of, of the OBIE, I, I think I think we've got 
we, we, we've got the, the cards are hopefully going to be played right. I'm hoping so. So look, in light of those three priorities, and thank you for that, um, and those three trends, well, what should we look forward to for this year? Well, what do we need to be ready for? Um, I mean, I'd look to the Treasury's consultation on, on the PSRs. Um, yes. It's helping to perform that. Um, you know, need to mention consumer duty. That's going to be a big compliance task for the industry. Um, you know, the, the regulators have made it clear that they want every CEO to be thinking about consumer duty. There's yeah. a clear time frame through 2023 for implementation and embedding that in the business. Um, so that, that's, I think, key priority number one. Um, there will be, going back to our discussion earlier, I believe changes to those safeguarding rules. Um, and I think both safeguarding banks as well as payment providers um, need to really be focused on those consultations and, mm. um, you know, making their voices heard so that the rules work for the industry. Yeah. I think that's going to be a 2023 priority. Um, and then a little bit kind of, you know, a little bit of a wild card is buy now, pay later. Um, mm. You know, it, it's had a clear focus from from the regulators um the rules are obviously um you know that that they're, they're there for everyone to see the the, the 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 draft rules um but they're a little bit different and unique compared to the consumer credit rules which are in place for other types of credit businesses mm. so i think ensuring compliance with with those for the npl providers is crucial but I would also have a watching brief on what's going on in the broader consumer credit environment because you know the, the government's made it clear its intention to rewrite that rule book. Um, yes, yes. You know, which is you know, a 1974 uh, law which was published. It's fairly, uh, you know, fairly aged, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on the credit market therefore the payments market and buy now pay later market yeah fascinating it's got it's, it's an it's the interplay of credit and payments yeah. it doesn't we don't see very often do we but in in terms of bnpl it, it absolutely is relevant to our industry because it's facilitating the payment of uh, the purchasing of, of things but equally it's about lending and credit so the two worlds are talking to each other and it's an innovative legal question as well right because you know that whole in that whole industry of buy now pay later you know in a sense, was facilitated by a legal exemption to the consumer credit regime, um, and it's that exemption and and you know that that, that in a self in a sense created uh, the ecosystem for for a new technology innovation. Um, so again, how these rules are drafted is really important. Well, we're, we're kind of we're going to be influenced a lot by the consultations coming through. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a bit of an unfair question, really, which is: to, to how much confidence do you have that the capacity of the institutions who are facilitating those consultations and ultimately define the law? Are going to do so in a way that's going to enable innovation. So I'm, I'm an innovator. My my instinct is to be innovation first, rather. And I don't. And I really am concerned about the wave of of potential additional compliance with the consumer duty or other things that could potentially be a stifling innovation and, and curtailing investment. Yeah. Um, and I think they've got a really difficult job. If you think about it, um, the moment legislation or a new regulation is published, it's out of date already. The, you know, the speed yeah. technology innovation means that Regulators have to try and adopt this technology neutral view of, of, of regulation, but it, it's always going to be playing catch up to technology and informed by technology. Um, I would say looking back at history, which I think is always important, you know, the first payment service directive and the second payment service directive, I think played actually played a key role in the expansion of this industry. Yeah. Um, so, you know, new law can have a positive impact on, on, on the industry and, and provide a sort of sandbox for um, businesses to be able to have the confidence to invest and, and thrive. I think the key thing for that, you know, you know, to encourage that investment is 
uh, is certainty. Um, I think Brexit, the broader economic environment, have led to a number of years, unfortunately, of, of uncertainty. Um, my hope is that now that the dust has started to settle on some of those issues, um, that you know, regulators will be able to provide more certainty. And I have confidence, actually. I think there's a reason why London is you know, the world's greatest financial center. Um, for many reasons, but certainly one of them is our legislative and regulatory system. Yeah. And if you look at the you know the future of financial services review um, and the approach that the Treasury is going to adopt, it's it's a flexible approach to regulation. It's saying you know we will we will set the perimeter with short law, um, but what we're not going to do is draft this you know horrendously long sort of almost civil code which um you know which which sets out exactly what you can and, and but, but that's what that's what the americans do and and they have 11 regulators around financial services and that's why it's so challenging it's one of the reasons why oh. payments is is, is behi behind our, our that's why the consumers don't benefit as much as they do here is because their industry is curtailed by the the rules based rather than principle rate based so so you're you're an advocate of that approach are you? i'm an advocate i'm an advocate of you know the regulators having the power to publish their own regulations without mm. having to go back to parliament every time mm. um provided that they have objectives you know one of which is innovation and and we've made those changes over the years so that regulators are focused on innovation so i have you know i have confidence in 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 that approach um and and i do think that you know more regulation isn't necessarily a bad thing but but it is a really careful balance and that's where i think the industry associations like the payments association have an absolutely crucial role to play is in industry advocates helping to inform the regulators um, as to in industry perspectives and ensure that you know, when the rules are drafted, they're not causing that level of, of friction. Um, I think it's a crucial part of our ecosystem. Yeah, very good. Well, we'll do, certainly do our best. I, I, there's so many things we could chat about here, and I'm aware that you know, time is marching on. A couple of, I want to move on to a couple of other things. Um, what, what advice would you give for any payments professional trying to keep up to date with what's going on? Um, it, it's a fantastic question. Uh, you know, if you had all, all the time in the world, it'd be read everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. No one has all of the time in the world. Well, I mean, apart from, apart from hire the best lawyers, of course. I don't. Uh, you know, that was going to be the second <laughs> thing I said. But you know, I, what I would say is, there's there's a, a ton of kind of fascinating um, and important, I think, industry um, led reports. Um, some of them published by yourselves, not to sort of blow the payments association trumpet, but you know, it's, it you. is impressive. Yeah. And I think staying using that as a conduit um, to help understand some of the changes is important. I think there are a number of providers that draft, you know, really interesting blog posts that help to compress some of the verbiage um, of yeah. some of these, these reports, <clears throat> the reports published by European institutions, they're three, 400 pages long. Um, so I think it's, it's finding a good source of uh, opinion um, and, and, and certainly the industry associations provide that in the UK. Um, I think that's a, a great way to say so, so, so read read the right stuff, don't read all the stuff. And I think that's that's that would be that's that's a good bit of advice because it's essentially especially since actually there are a whole series of deep silos of knowledge in this industry, and you can't possibly be in all of them. You've got to sort of have, I think, a, a bit of a view on everything. It, that's right. I think it's, you know, the just the, the ecosystem has expanded to be so mm -hmm. broad, even just within payments, um, you know, rather than the broader financial markets, you couldn't possibly read everything. So no, quite. Um, relying on the right experts to help inform, you know, views, I think is is pretty crucial. Very good, very good. So, look, we're going to um, go to one other subject I want to talk about, but in, in just a quick answer to something specifically about this this whole area of programmable digital assets. We're publishing a white paper soon on this, um, and, and stable coins, which I'm I'm a big fan of. And to what extent do you think um, 
stable co stable coins are if you like the new e money if you, is s money the new e money what to what extent do you, do you think that's kind of uh, you can you can have a read across from s money to e money yeah i mean that's certainly what the regulators and legislators seem to be wanting us to to do um you know and to an extent i think it's a really exciting innovation i think that um you know, really could take the baton from the e-money regulations, but drive forward in, in an innovative new way. I think, however, it, we should be really cautious about just taking our existing rule book and applying it to this new technology. Mm. There's some really fundamental differences between digital e-money, um, you know, supported by a digital asset and, and, and an e-money wallet. I mean, the primary yes. difference is typically an e-money product, you know, under the current law is 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 a personal wallet that, um, you know, you can make payments, you know, to and from. Um, whereas an e-money token is itself a product which you can transfer to someone else. You can't transfer your e-money wallet to something someone else. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so, true. And you know, that has all sorts of interesting implications. For example, for the issuer of of, of that e-money token um, versus an e-money wallet, where does the obligation to perform AML KYC start and stop? Because if I issue that e-money token. Um, to you, Tony, for example, and then you send it to someone else that I, as the issuer, don't have any relationship whatsoever. Do I have to perform AML KYC on that third person? Oh, goodness, goodness. Um, you would always perform AML KYC on on you know the person that you have a relationship with for a wallet. So that's you know that's one issue. I mean, safeguarding, for example, the safeguarding rules would say that. Um, whoever provides a payment service with respect to that token needs to safeguard the the underlying fiat. Yes. But how does that work if I see my token and I safeguard the fiat which sits underneath it and then the second payment service provider processes the payment, they won't have access to the fiat that I um, yeah, that's true. I do as the issuer. So we need to make sure the rules are drafted in a way which um really understands the technology and i think we have to move a little bit away from technology neutral regulation um you know and and, and uh, really iterate for some of these uh, challenges this is going to be an exciting phase isn't it it yeah. really is and 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 you know my, my parents would find it very funny listening to me talking about how excited i am about the implications of of, of the interchange of technology and law uh, with this new wave of innovation, and I, I you know, the, the new order, the world order of fintech is changing, and, and lawyers are playing a central part of that. Uh, uh, there's so many other things I'd love to chat about, but I'm, I'm going to ask you just one final question, Stuart, if I may. So you've got your three kids, and congratulations on your new newish daughter, um, <laughs> by me. Um, uh, I, I would like to th just imagine you're sort of sitting here and you're advising, you're advising a youngster, maybe a. Um, somebody thinking about a career in law. Um, what, what advice would you give a new graduate who approached you and said, you know, they were thinking about following in, in your footsteps? What advice would you give them? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I'd start by saying, don't follow in my footsteps. Um, <laughs> don't do not, what I did. <laughs> yeah, not, not because um, I don't think law is a valuable career, I absolutely do, but, but I just think the path for someone starting today would be completely different from the path that I took. You know, we were in a, we were kind of pre-fintech when I, or certainly pre-fintech as we know it now when I started. Mm. So the path was much more, you know, well-trodden. It was, you know, go to university, study law, um, get a job at a law firm. You know, if you wanted to go into financial services, you would go into the financial services regulatory department or a law mm -hmm. firm, and you would advise investment banks and banks, um, and and then you you know progress with with technology. And I think it's really important to get a you know very broad grounding in um, financial markets, as I've, I've said. But there's so many different ways now and paths into the industry. We have 
apprenticeships um, in, in the legal industry. So, you know, no longer is going to university and doing a law degree the only way into to, mm. in, in, into the industry. I, I would say something that I found incredibly important in my career was spending some time in um, in, in a client in, in industry. Um, and I would really encourage that path as well, because I think in terms of understanding clients' objectives and um, seeking to meet those, I think you, you need to put your you know yourself in the shoes of, of the clients. Mm. Um, but I think you know certainly just the way in which we practice law is, is different now. We now have um, fintech practices and payments practices within law firms, um, which you know look much more closely at this industry rather than sort of traditional financial regulatory practices. And I think I'd be encouraging someone that wants to come into this industry to um, you know look towards those new and um, more focused kind of practices. Very, very interesting advice. It's very clear to me that we're not going to be replaced immediately by um, some sort of legal chat bot, <laughs> uh, GTP or something. Yeah. Um, I, um, th that's very sound advice. Thank you. I, I, I think um, I've, I've loved this conversation. Really appreciate the chance to chat. Stuart, you've been a great um, uh, advocate of our industry and, and of, our, of our community and, and a great contributor. So thank you for that. Um, on behalf of, we have to bring this to a close, sadly, on behalf of, of our members um, and our audience, uh, Stuart Davis, thank you very much indeed for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks so much, Tony.